Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Stephen Gray and Jens Jacob. And Stephen is the director and Jens is the producer of the upcoming movie about near-death experiences called After Death. And I'm so excited that they've agreed to come on and talk about this exciting movie. So um, I don't know who wants to start. We didn't really plan this. We just thought we'd get together and share some excitement about this movie coming up um, October 27th. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us on, Peggy. Yeah. Thank you. Here. So, Stephen, you started on this several years ago. Is that correct? With um, uh, one particular, I'm trying to think of his name, the pilot. Yeah, Dale, Dale Black. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, I can I can kind of start things off and kind of sharing, you know, the why behind the film and really kind of where it, where it originated. So um, I've been a filmmaker for about 15 years now, um, mostly kind of in, in commercial space, uh, some short kind of docs and that kind of stuff I had done. But this is my first feature length film. And uh, a number of years ago, my brother-in-law was, uh, he was killed in a car wreck. And, um, and for me, you know, like kind of facing death, uh, you know, that I guess strongly, um, losing him, he was 36 years old, uh, just kind of caused me to ask a lot of questions. So I grew up, uh, going to a church all my life, um, you know, evangelical church as a Christian. And, um, but during that time, honestly, it was, uh, I had well, a major crisis of faith. Um, I, I, I kind of really didn't believe that there was really anything after for a period of time. Um, but during the course of that, uh, some people had recommended uh, books to me and my wife and, and her, her mother, my mother-in-law as well, uh, about people who had these near-death experiences. And so this is, this is my first time hearing about this. Kind of never really came across uh, the idea before. And... Um, I don't know. I'm I'm not always I'm not a huge book person. So <laughs> truth be told, I didn't really, you know, read a lot of these stories uh, initially. But um, I actually someone gave me it was a, you know, this explains how far how long ago it was. It was a CD. <laughs> which you don't really listen to anymore. And it was it was a uh, there was some like audio interviews of um, just long form just conversations about people who died and what they saw. And the first one I heard was. Dr. Richard uh, Eby and and um, so he had he had died. He's a doctor and a physician. And he had died uh, from falling basically like two stories from a building and landed on a sidewalk and his head had basically split open. So pretty gruesome and and uh, but the the interesting thing that really kind of caught my attention was just how he was describing what his next moment was. Um, it was just. It, it was something in his voice and it was the way he was describing it. That was just like, it, it was so sincere and so authentic. And it, it was also very, you know, it was quite grand, you know, like he had this heavenly experience. He saw his body from outside of his body. And this is my first time kind of hearing all these different things. And that just, that just stayed with me. I mean, it, I, I couldn't let that go. And that's what made me, you know, read something like 30 books and go down this path. Um, you know, and then all these years later, uh, I was basically just trying to find a film that uh, that had these stories. Um, I, I, you know, I love I love consuming movies. I love you know, especially watching documentaries. And I, I wasn't seeing anything like that out there. I was getting it in book form. I got this one audio CD, but I, I couldn't find anything other than you know, 1970s that had anything to do with near death experiences. And so, um, yeah, I was just like, well, I, I think these stories need to be told. Um, so I used my kind of abilities as a filmmaker to to go and tell one i that's you know the only thing i could do with with you know my abilities and finances and stuff was go and tell one so i, I went and told captain dale black story uh who was a pilot who died in a plane crash in 1969 he collided uh with two other pilots into a monument in burbank um and the other two pilots um stayed dead um and he became the sole survivor of that plane crash. And, you know, his whole life is like transformed from that one experience. This happened, you know, so many years ago. And, you know, I had the opportunity to meet him, talk to him, talk to his family, talk to people who were kind of around the scene and um, uh, all those years ago. And that, it, it was, um, yeah, I don't know, like meeting him and talking to him and hearing all of that was just like, it just stayed with me. And I, I felt like this, 
you know, this story is probably one of the most important things so far in my career that, you know, I could be a part of. So I put that out there and, um, you know, it, was, it, it, it did pretty well in terms of like short film festival markets and that kind of stuff. I uh, got some national attention in Canada. But the same year, uh, Jens and Jason from Cypress Studios had just put out a beautiful film called The Heart of Man. And it was released theatrically. And um, they made a film that kind of touches on a really dark, uh, heavy topic. Um, but it was most, you know, one of the most stunning, visually stunning and, and beautiful, like sonically film and documentary that I had ever heard or, or, or seen. And I just thought, like, how on earth do these guys pull this off? You know, here I am. I made a little a 10 minute short and it was it was hard. But the intention was always to make a feature. I was always interested in how all these stories kind of can overlap and and see the bigger picture of what's going on. But I only had the ability to, to tell one. So then I, I reached out to them and connected with them. And and um, I mean, I think they enjoyed the, the 10 minute and they could definitely see the vision for the for the feature. And so uh, we partnered up at that point. OK, yeah, we, we we get a lot of emails. And so it was kind of funny that one, I saw it, but two that you know after seeing it um we we had saw the 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 short film and we're, we were blown away uh because it was very similar to how we would potentially tackle a topic and just how um you, you know usually when you think of uh experiences about the afterlife or heaven or, or near death it, it can often go cheesy or it could easily just go right. clouds and cherubs and like you know it, it could be a very specific type of film and Steve didn't go that way. And, and so we were very impressed with the vision that was behind it. Um, and also personally for me, like, you know, I've always also just struggled with the idea of like, you know, what, what happens when we die. And and so it was, I, I was curious and I had heard of NDEs before, but didn't really do a deep dive and in being able to see that short and talk with Steve and hear the amount of science that was behind it. It was really mind blowing for me, um, you know, coming into it. And so yeah, we decided um, to to take this seriously, and, and and we partnered with Steve and Chris, and yeah, I'm so grateful that 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 you brought it to us. That's cool. That is being taken seriously. I think that's important too. That's not cheesy. That is not just all scientific. That you know the the stories tell. I think what we need to know about this. The, the meat is in the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. The thing we wanted to do with with the film was to kind of do both, right? Like it was right. like, which was hard. It was it definitely, you know, it's like we're trying to find that right balance. And I think we we did that with this film, but um, it was trying to explore both sides. It was kind of something to speak to the mind, to speak to the head, to the intellect. Kind of, you know, if if you've, you know, if you couldn't really get behind this idea that this really does happen, at least we can kind of like to Jen's point, speak to the science and speak to the data and. And hear from the doctors, even doctors' perspectives who are kind of grappling with this notion of people kind of coming back, even with the resuscitation efforts and whatnot. But then, you know, to them describing things that they're seeing in the hospital room and all that kind of stuff. It's like, what, what do you do with all of that? So we're, we're going trying to explore that as well as as hearing from the stories. Because, yeah, the stories to me is, well, me in, in, in grief and loss is what's kind of speaking to me the most. Um, but also I, I think the science and, and all of the research is out there is really um it's 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 profound it's amazing it's it's also it was cool to see in the ex exploration of this film to see how much there was out there you know yeah i, I, don't I, think I was just gonna say that too like it, it's not even just like the stories it's like the chorus of stories like how much was out there and it was all similar you know that's where you know you go from like it just being a story to like oh is this real uh you know when there's when there's more than two or three people just talking about it so yeah that was really cool to see yeah it's good for people to realize too the decades of research that's been around this subject too i don't think people realize the doctors scientists that have been spending decades researching this the near death experiences yeah yeah that's exactly. so true so I saw you have uh, Captain Dale Block, you have Mary Neal, um, Howard Storm. I actually interviewed one guy that's on there for a little bit. Um, Dean Braxton. Oh, yeah. He's yep. there a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Um, who else is there on this? 
film. So we interviewed 14 different people who had near-death experiences, okay. but kind of the, the ones who've written books and are maybe a little more known. Uh, Don Piper, yeah, 90 Minutes in Heaven. Dr. Mary Neal, who, to wrote, who wrote To, to Heaven and Back. Dale Black of uh, Flight to Heaven. Dr. Jeffrey Long. Uh, who wrote the the book Evidence for the Afterlife, and he also um, created Near Death Experience Research Foundation, uh, which has accumulated something like almost five thousand uh, experiences, you know, studied from basically around the world. Uh, Dr. Michael Sabum, who actually was one of the founders of um, IANS, uh, which was at the beginning was kind of like this this research group, and and it was you know to stay kind of strictly scientific and and studying uh, experiences. And he wrote the book Recollections of Death as a cardiologist. Uh, John Burke, who's the author of Imagine Heaven. And John's book, I think, uh, does a really good job uh, uh, kind of comparing near to the experiences. In his book, he kind of goes into uh, hyper focuses on 100 accounts. But he himself had studied basically 1,000 accounts over the course of about 30 years and personally investigated these accounts. And uh, he does a good job of kind of like from a bigger picture, like seeing what's going on. And that's something we were doing with the kind of the stories like Jens was saying, it's like this chorus of stories. We wanted to see kind of the bigger picture of what's, what's going on in the commonalities and overlap. Um, Dr. Raymond Moody's in the film too, who coined the term near to the experience wrote the book life after life. Um, Howard storm is really kind of our hero story in the film who wrote uh, my descent into death. And then we also have uh, Dr. Zamar who um, in 2022 uh, published a study uh, on, on the first ever recorded uh, dying human brain, which was really exciting to, you know, have him in the film and, and, and see some of that, you know, new research that, that it was just this, this stunning new study that came out uh, with really rare circumstances. And this was, it was cool to include that in the film as well. And, and we got lucky with that just because of the happenstance of it just happened. And, and we were in post-production and it was like, oh, we have to figure out if we could include this. So that was a very exciting turn of events when when that did. And, you know, I, I just maybe my ignorant self, I thought something like that had already happened maybe years ago. It's crazy that in 2022, that was the first time we first ever one. Yeah. Uh, were able to to see that. So, yeah, that was exciting to include in the film. Fine intervention. Mm hmm. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long's website years ago, I think maybe 2011, that was the first time I ever shared my experiences was on his website. Oh, wow. Awesome. So you went I through thought, the whole survey process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then like 2017, I published my book and his wife, Jody Long, um, endorsed the back. And then uh, 2019, I was on Dr. Oz and they had Dr. Jeffrey Long on the screen to pop up and say, what do you think about Peggy's experience? And so, oh, yeah, I believe in angels. And so that was cool. Oh, that's cool. Wow. Yeah, that's very cool. Amazing. So what surprises you guys about these near death experiences? Is there anything that sticks with you that like, I didn't know this or? Yeah. I mean, for me, there's a lot <laughs> that surprised me and, and, and stayed with me for sure. Um, you know, so I guess some of the bigger things would be, uh, again, this is going to be something we keep saying, but it's just like how, how much of what they're kind of talking about initially from their experience overlaps with other people. Uh, we have this really unique opportunity in going out and actually talking directly with so many people who had near to the experiences, including some remote calls with people around the world. And, um, and then, you know, I think there was, there was for sure a handful of people that we, that we had the privilege of talking to that had never really either shared their story or certainly never published it before, you know, really apprehensive to kind of really talk about it. Um, but, uh, but even those people, the, the same experiences or things that they're seeing and, and feeling and all that kind of stuff, the same way they're, they're relaying it in, in different cultures and different countries, it's the same thing as we're getting in North America. Which, which was, you know, amazing, I, I think. Um, but some of the things that were, I guess, were perplexing would be um, a common term that people would use, not everyone, but it would at least describe in a similar way, would be like stepping into eternity. So it's like in that different dimension or that other space that they're kind of hopping out into, um, whether that's an out-of-body experience or even when people like Don's case, he doesn't have that, but he goes like direct to heaven. Um, in some cases, it's 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 something else like a void. But either way, when they're in when they're stepping out into this other kind of realm, 
the description of it was fascinating. You know, that seems to be that time doesn't exist, um, or at least that it's it's felt or experienced differently. Not the same that it's here. And there seemed to be almost like uh, Steve talks about in the film, Steve King, that it's like a, a different set of rules. Um, that it's not necessarily like everything that the way it works here is is applicable there. It's just like you're in now in a different dimension entirely than than what's here. And yet many of them could see, you know, this world and and and, and you know, experience this world at, at the same time in that sort of in-between place. So uh, I think that's something that really stayed with me. I think, um, and it's so true, that, that part for me as well. I think another part that really stayed with me was just, or surprised me was that they weren't all positive experiences. You know, some saw hell or, you know, just wasn't even thinking that that was like a, a, a possibility. And then also for, for a lot of people, I would have thought, you know, I was definitely one of the more skeptical, uh, team members, if you will. And so it was like constantly asking questions and, uh, try, trying to go on my own journey of discovery with this, but, you know, a part that I thought or a misconception that I think I had prior was that people had something to gain by coming up with stories or, or writing books about them, or, you know, that it then becomes like this very profitable experience. But like for, for a lot of these stories, as you hear them coming back, it wasn't all rainbows and butterflies. It was actually in many ways worse. Like they either wanted to go back or, you know, they've tried to tell people about it, but people wouldn't believe them and families broken apart. It was just, you know, nobody would just do that just to make it up, like to li to live the life that they lived afterwards. And some of the stuff that they had to go through is just holding on to a conviction that they had, that it was just so much more real than, than what existed now. And, and so that was very, um, hard to watch, but also it, it, it really did stick with me that, that there's something beyond, you know, call it money or whatever might, might be my skepticism. Yeah, I've done, um, like 350 some interviews on my show so far in the last three years, near death experiencers and researchers. And I'm learning all the time, even though I've had two NDEs myself, um, and, you know, what you said about time, you know, to hear so many stories and how time was different for them. And I know how it was for me. And then um, what you were saying about, um, you know, it's not just a Christian thing. Um, and it seemed like when I was with Ions, it seemed like they wanted to keep the Christian part out of it. They wanted it all scientific. And then me being Christian, I wanted it for everybody. I wanted everybody to be able to come on and share their story, whatever their truth is. I want to hear the real experience because I think that's the only way we're going to learn from these is everybody can just share what they saw, what they heard, what they mm -hmm. experienced without having to fit in any box. And yeah, right. we always wonder, you know, are, are they making this up? So they have the best selling book or, you know, they trying for attention, but then, um, and I'm sure that's going to happen with anything. But there is um, a lot of science, I think, to be found in these stories because it's not, you know, people say, oh, the Bible, they think they're all Christian and they're not all Christian. Um, and I think more and more Christians into ease are coming out because a lot of churches wouldn't allow this to be talked about in their churches. They thought it was antichrist. They right. thought it was a bad thing. And so they were being kept out. And then with the new age people not wanting to go the Christian route on these experiences, it looked like they weren't Christian at all. And some of them are very Christian and, and right. they don't have to fit in that box of, of Christian, you know, their experiences that people have had all over the country. And, and even though they're so different, there's so many similarities in the way the communication was showed on the other side too, yeah. which is, fascinates me. You know, the telepathic communication scenes open up and they see this like a movie that just explains something to them without words. And mm -hmm. it's just common themes coming over and over. That's how it is over there. Yeah. I mean, John Burke, he talks about this in the film and I feel like, you know, in a way we kind of did this in terms of story in the way we put together our film, but he talks about, um, you know, after studying a thousand different, uh, you know, accounts of near-death experiences, there, of course, there are, 
you know, differences and they're kind of individual, but it's almost like, you know, if you drop someone, uh, he says it this way. It's like, if you drop two people in New York state, one person in Manhattan, someone up upstate and, and you just have an hour to experience New York as a state. Um, and you, you take that in for an hour and then you come back and then you, you ship somewhere else, other side of the world. And you have to report what was New York state like describe it. You know, and you're gonna have two completely different you know experiences, and yet you know in descriptions, but you know there may be some overlap in that, right? right. Like in terms of coast or or the feel, I don't know. But there's gonna be oh, two different. Ex even to add to that analogy, one one thing that John also says is this idea of um, if you don't have like the like vernacular or language to put for what you saw, like you know if I'm seeing something that does is doesn't exist here, um, it's like similar to like describing blue to somebody that's born colorblind. Like how, how do you do it? Like you just don't, they don't have the visual capability to understand what the color blue is. And you don't even have the vernacular other than pointing to the sky or like trying to describe the emotion of, of blue. There's not really like a, and so I, I found that interesting because to, to, to Steve's point, you could be in, trying to describe a very different thing, but also you might not even have the language for it. Uh, and then, so all these people that have seen it are trying to, to latch on to their best understanding or their best, you know, adjective for something. And if you pay attention enough, I think you can see and understand the similarities when, when, when they're describing something. Um, but independently you might not fully understand. So that, that that's why I still love the idea that anytime somebody's done like a movie or maybe their own book, it's their own experience. What I love about our particular film is the, the chorus kind of says a lot. I think when you're hearing similar things, uh, from different people, from different backgrounds. And, um, another point of skepticism for me was like, oh, I thought maybe only the West had it or people that were Christian and, and, and to, to see that it wasn't just that was very fascinating that, you know, it didn't matter what their background was. Uh, they, they still would experience something. Yeah. It's like the afterlife is for everyone, not just some mm -hmm. it's for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, I was going to say really quickly to jump off that point to, um, I guess like cultural influence and stuff like that. Cause like one, one thing, uh, in terms of like a, well, a view that I even had for a very short time, <laughs> after kind of going through my loss um, was, I mean, if, if I had to give up the idea of heaven, I don't think I can, you know, really subscribe to the idea that there is a God because how, for me, it was kind of like, how, how could there be a God and, and yet there'd be such chaos. It's just, everything's out of order in my life here. It doesn't make any sense. It's random. Someone just randomly gets killed. Doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Um, so, uh, but then I found that, you know, when these people are having these experiences, um, one one uh, one thing you could argue is, I mean, if if there is no spirit and if there's no soul, and all all we are is our material brain, then um, then uh, then really it should be culturally influenced, right? So um, so to Jen's point, you know, let's just say in the United States of America, because it's known to be you know culturally, let's say a more Christian kind of country or Christian nation, at least in terms of exposure. To, to the average citizen then you could say well the, you know people are only seeing angels or jesus or or heaven or whatever that is because it's a north american experience and so whatever you're kind of being influenced by whether it's the culture film yeah. television everything kind of in america that could be something your brain's absorbing and then it's hallucinating and just giving whatever you know image is 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 it's being influenced by but then you should come to expect um that in other cultures and other religions where um they're getting they're getting you know thrown completely different images and understanding of the afterlife um then their you know near-death experience should be exactly that as well then it should be really specifically that but the the interesting thing for me was as we're interviewing so many people from different cultures and backgrounds and even different religions um was that no? There, there was there was that similarity and overlap, despite there being so many differences in culture and background and religion, um, and so that was interesting to me because again, that just kind of like you know further established that I don't think we are just our material brain and that's it because 
our brain was, let's just say, hallucinating and it was just taking in whatever we've been fed throughout all these years. Well, then why are these some of these people having something that's so counter to their culture, counter to their religion, counter to what they came to, ex- uh, you know, expect uh, in, in this moment? Um, it doesn't really make sense. Right. I know for mine, mine, a second was 25 years old, ectopic pregnancy. And I went to the emergency rooms, having this pain and it stopped on the way there. And so I had no more signs of a problem. And in the hallway of the emergency room, as they're pushing me in a wheelchair, I died. And I had this heaven experience. And then I was back and I was told it was my time. My doctor examined me and he said, Peggy, it's not an ectopic pregnancy. Why did you keep saying that? Well, I knew because I was just in heaven accepting it. I was about dead here. And so he was going to discharge me. And I thought, so that means I'm going to go home and die. And my sons, my little boys, I three little boys home. They're going to find me dead. I can't have that. So I thought I'm going to die. I'll just die right here. I'm not going to die at home because I knew that NDE was real. It's 1986. I never heard of NDE, but I knew whatever that was, it was real. I was just in heaven. So I said, I'm not going home. And I couldn't tell him why, because I was afraid he'd put me in the psych ward if I told him about being in heaven. So he looked at my husband like, what's wrong with her? And so my husband just shook his shoulders like, I don't know. So the doctor went home, my husband went home. And so the next morning, I'll make it short, but the, uh, the doctor come in, did an ultrasound, found I had internal bleeding, filling my entire abdominal cavity, clear up to my chest. He says the biggest tool of wow. the hospital I ever saw. He rushed me oh, into wow. surgery. And if it, my NDE saved my life, because if I hadn't had that experience, when he said, you're fine, because all my symptoms have went away. I would have believed him and I would have went home and died. I wouldn't be here. And so I thought, what was that? You know, all these decades later, what I understand now about NDEs, I just think I wish that doctors would understand because I hear it a lot in the other stories of people that saw and talk about their NDE, you know, say they say, well, I had a heart attack and on the way in the squad to the hospital, I was flying over top the squad and, you know, I got there and maybe they discharge them, go send them home or they're in the hospital. They had surgery. They think they're doing fine. They have this NDE and they can't communicate because of the taboo, the culture. We can't say, Hey, I was just having accepted now what's going on, you know, or I was fighting to come back. Now I'm back. And these should be indicators to triage nurses, to doctors that if a patient comes in and says, you know, I don't know what's going on, but I just had the experience. I was in heaven or I was out of my body. That should teach them. We need to look a little closer. What's going on with this patient because they might be near death. What we have learned. That's why I wish they would say, you know, what we have learned from these near death experiences is some people have these close to death. Now they know it. The nurses know it when a patient is dying, they know they're dying. Say they have cancer, they're elderly. Maybe they've even had dementia and not been lucid in years. All of a sudden they're lucid. All of a sudden right. they're say, you know, my husband's coming to get me. I see my mother. You know, they know they have these communications right before death, but yet, and they recognize those. The nurses know, oh, well, so-and-so, this patient will be dying soon because they had this experience, but they don't understand that NDE as indicator as well. And mm. you know, I just, that's my little wish that um, we could get these to where the, medical community could realize this could be, you know, an indicator of impending death. Maybe we need to look a little sooner if they're describing, right. but also too, like your movie, you know, that more people know about these that may not have ever heard of them and say, maybe next, the next week, maybe somebody will have a heart attack and they have an experience and they tell the doctor, you know, I had one of those things they called NDE. Do you think that means I'm, or otherwise they would have kept it quiet. I'm not going to look like a fool telling I was just talking yeah. to Jesus or with the angels yeah. or whatever. Totally. Yeah. I, I think that's what's an ama- amazing about the opportunity that we have here because we have the ability to push this more into the mainstream because obviously movies shape and affect culture and just the ability to have uh, uh, the distribution that we have. Uh, one thing I was going to say here was that for anybody that's watching that has had NDEs before, I'm sure everybody's felt crazy at some point or scared to talk about their stories or whatever it might be. But we, we collectively, I think, have an ability to change that conversation with a movie like this. So it's really important as we're doing very well in pre-sales, it, it's showing the industry, it's showing uh, you know, the, the Hollywood, uh, 
the appetite for stuff like this and it it is like something that's widely searched something that's widely talked talked about maybe like in closed groups but we we have the ability to kind of put it into another sphere uh, so we would encourage anybody watching if if you can go to angel.com forward slash after death and uh, you can pre-buy tickets even now pre-buy them for even loved ones or people that you've wanted to talk to this talk to somebody about but haven't they haven't been been willing to listen uh i think this is a great opportunity for something like that yeah yeah exactly yeah no yeah it's going to be playing in theaters october 27th um the cool thing is yeah we, we partnered with angel studios who's uh who's our distribution partner uh putting this in, in into theaters and to jen's point it's like I mean, this film, in terms of the release, is already in in a in a top top ten all time in terms of uh, amount of theaters that it's going into for a documentary. Like we, it's it's you know it's very rare for a documentary to have this much this wide of a release, but even more rare, obviously, with with this topic. Um, and so, yeah, I I hope that it does have that opportunity to shape culture and that people do um, come in and watch it. And I yeah, I just. I mean, it's the intention with the film too. Is just like I found these stories so helpful and 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 brought a lot of hope for me personally. Um, going through grief, I think that was another side to this too. Is that people even who even have haven't had a near death experience that but are, have faced grief or, or are going through something like that in their in their life. I think these stories um, offer a lot of hope, and um, and that's kind of the intention with the film too. Is you know, I, I hope that these stories kind of speak to people in the same way that it spoke to me. Isn't this the first Christian documentary ever? I heard that somewhere. Is that correct? I don't think it'd be the the first. The, okay. the, we we actually I was I was gonna say like re- really quickly, um, just to clarify too with the film. So I, I am a, a Christian. Um, I'm the director of the film, and uh, and most of the people that are kind of involved, I guess with the film to kind of come from a bit of a faith background. But something that was really important uh, when we created the film was uh, because, you know, to our point earlier of, of that these stories are happening everywhere and that this isn't just a Christian thing, like the preconceived notion that, you know, these near the experiences are only happening to Christians and it's just kind of a Christian little um, thing uh, isn't the case. And so uh, we intentionally went into the film uh, not, not you know we don't have people in the film for example that kind of come in and talk theology for you know 20 minutes because it's just not that's not the lane that's not something that makes sense in this film we wanted the stories to kind of speak for themselves the near to the experiences to be, speak for themselves and then the science as well to to kind of articulate you know that side the medical side um so we don't really um we don't spoon feed anyone we definitely definitely don't hit anyone over the head or inter- like kind of inject our kind of the way we see the world uh, we just kind of let these near the experiences like shape that and and uh and tell that story which i mean to me um at, you know after you know watching the film i think the film does point people to god um that's i mean that's how i see it uh, not maybe not everyone's going to take it that way but that was the bigger picture for me is i think that um i think that that's the that's the reality at the end of the day you know there's all these near different near the experiences all around the world, whether they're heavenly or hellish near the experiences, but they're all kind of pointing to this reality uh, that, that this does exist after death. And that, uh, and then all, all, the other thing too, is, I mean, my, my hope is that it causes people to reflect. It's one thing to, about the reality of, of, of kind of heaven and, and hell that, that exists on the other side, but also, you know, what does that mean for this life? You know, what are we going to do with the time that we have here? And that was one of the cool things too, to Jen's point earlier of, you know, the transformation in some of these people is pretty significant and especially, uh, you know, turning their life around in service to others. Many of the people in our film and many, many of the people that we had the opportunity to talk to, I mean, totally transformed their life around. Um, you know, Mary might be an example of where, you know, she didn't change her career. She's a, she's a doctor, right. but she's already in service to people. Um, but she's thinking differently about, you know, everyday interactions with people. Uh, part of Mary's near experiences is, is she's shown um, she's shown in a life review, um, you know, her life, but also the lives of people around her and and sort of the backstory of of their of their life, which she wouldn't even have seen. Right. Like people 
uh, she wouldn't that she wouldn't have known their earlier life, but yeah, she's shown that, and then she's shown, you know, what what brought them to a point of where she had either hurt them or they had hurt, you know, her or someone she loved, and she she's seen that from a perspective that she can't otherwise see. She can't see here on Earth, you know. It's I think she describes it as twenty, twenty five, thirty five people removed from herself. Um, you know, these people aren't people she's she's meeting. And she's seeing like the ripple effect of choices that she's making in this life and how that affects others, you know, good or bad, small or big. Mary, in her story, she she moves from, I think it was California, where she, where she became a, a doctor and then she later moves to Wyoming. And that's a big move. That's a big change. You know, what is, what ripple does that have in that, just that move, right? Good or bad. You know, her life now digging down in Wyoming, um, you know, establishing herself there with her family, you know, the impact she's having on her community. That's obviously going to have a different impact. But then it also could be something as small as, you know, you're you're just opening the door for a stranger at a coffee shop. You know, you don't know that that one thing that you're doing could like change the course of that person's day, which then later has like other you know ripple effects on on you know further down from there. You know, you make you make a difference in someone's day, a smile, you know, thinking differently about people. I think that's that's the hope for the film too. Is just that. It causes people to reflect, and what what can we do with the time that we have here? And I've met Howard before, had dinner with him, went to his church, and went to lunch with his wife and him. And uh, you know the difference that it's made. You know, he him he went from atheist to a minister. So yeah, yeah, and he's the hero story in our film. It's a pretty wild transformation. Like, how do you go from an atheist university professor? Um, you know, and it's not just like a year in on on this, you know, atheist worldview. I think he, he was years in, I think decades uh, at that point. And that's where he was. You know, he doesn't believe there's anything after. Like he would, I think it's like a staunch atheist. There's just kind of all this seems to be these levels as I've talked to, you know, many of my friends um, who, you know, have that kind of worldview. Some would be a little, it's like open-handed, almost like leaning towards agnostic not really willing to accept that there's something but open and some that are just like no this is it and just not willing to you know listen to anything else that would be howard that's that's where he was in in his walk in his life and so he's he's there and his near experience transforms him to you know leaving his career behind taking a 90 percent pay cut and then becoming a pastor for the rest of his you know, remaining life still to this day how do you do that, right? And like we were talking about earlier, he's one of the stories where it didn't end up well. You know, his wife and his kids leave him as a result of him having this massive transformation. There was a conflict at home because he's so different. It's so serious, you know, and and he he's, so he's willing to kind of give up everything to pursue that because it was that so important it was. I mean, how do you, I don't think, why would you go and make up that story? And, and why would you do right. that much of a life transformation and commit right. to it lifelong if that wasn't real? When I met him, he was talking about he's getting ready to go on another uh, thing with his group where they go in prisons. And I think they spend like a few days there talking to the guys and they end up hugging and crying and and having the you know, bringing this experience with. You know, these miraculous events with with inmates and it had profound effect. And I heard the other day that they're starting to go in schools. Now this college, these college students are going to schools and sharing near that death experience with kids. And then following, following their behavior after that and how improved the kids behavior is. Mm, wow. That's so, cool. Yeah, that's interesting. So is there anything else we need to cover? I know it's like what 1800 uh, theaters across the United States and Canada. This will be in. Yeah, right. Yeah, right now we're at 1800. Uh, I mean, our, our hope is that we would get, you know, closer to 2000. We'll kind of see how that goes. But I mean, that's still, you know, a, a, that's huge for, for a film like this, especially an independent film um, being released in theaters uh, in that much, that wide of a release. So yeah, it starts October 27th. Um, but like Jen's mentioned, you know, you can go to angel.com slash after death. And look to uh, to see what theater it's playing near you, and 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 pre buy tickets. That just kind of helps. Um, like it, it helps with the industry uh, in terms of 
uh, just kind of establishing, oh, there is demand for it. Oh, people are interested in this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know it might be a little bit strange for some people to to buy tickets this far out from from the release date. Um, maybe not typical for other movies, but this this is an opportunity, I think, just to show the demand for this. That you know, okay. this topic in particular, near the experience, is is an important thing that we want to get out there. So. Because right now it's just set for a week, multiple times during the day before a week, correct? So maybe people go yeah. get their tickets now. It'll show that demand and maybe that'll spread. Yeah, exactly. particularly yep. for op opening weekend is a huge indicator for the industry okay. of, yeah. So definitely if you can, if you're, if you're listening, uh, I would say pre-buy tickets now and um, it, it should be in a local theater near you. Okay. All right. I was thinking this morning, maybe I'll make this little commercial after this one, like maybe put it up tomorrow. Like anybody that goes to see it to um, email me and I'll do a little like 10 minute clip and say how you loved it and put it on my show and put a bunch of those on there. It'd be fun. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That'd be yeah. awesome. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. Well, I thank you guys and I wish you all the luck. I can't wait to see the movie. I'm sure it'll be great. And um, I'll get this out here tonight so people can start scheduling, putting on the calendar that they're going to go see it, get their tickets. Amazing. Early. Thank oh, you, Becky. Great. It's been yeah, an honor. Thank you so much. Really appreciate yeah. you taking the time to do this with us. Ah, my pleasure. All right. Bye-bye. All righty. Take, take care. Take care. Bye.